I want to welcome Agile XRM to the podcast. I've known the people at Agile XRM for the past 12 years. I've seen how their business process management tool can add massive value to complex organizational processes in sectors such as finance and government. If you have complex processes or a need for dialogues on the Power Platform or Dynamics 365, take a look at how this BPM tool can add value. You can find them at agilexrm.com or check out the show notes for more details. Welcome to the Power Platform Show. Thanks for joining me today. I hope today's guest inspires and educates you on the possibilities of the Microsoft Power Platform. Now, let's get on with the show. All right. Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to episode four of the Ecosystems Podcast with Mark Smith, Chris Huntingford, Anna Demene, and I am Andrew Welch. Uh, Will Dorrington is not with us today. I actually don't know why, but he has things. The man has things tonight. He's a busy man. He's a busy man. He is a busy guy. I'm not saying he's getting busy, but he's a busy man. <laughs> we, don't, we don't take a yeah, position yeah. on what he does. I want to. No, I'm up for that, man. I'm definitely up for taking position. <laughs> <laughs> so today, today we are uh, we're going down to level three of the strategic pyramid, and uh, we're going to be talking about building the platform ecosystem. So for those of you who uh, are just joining us, if this is your first episode with us, I really encourage you go back, check some of the um, episodes one to three, but um, we'll kind of quickly recap. So hopefully you can see what I'm sharing. Um, and what I want to reintroduce again today is what we call the strategic pyramid. So in our model, and this is for value and, and how to value architecture and value uh, work in the cloud, generally the Microsoft cloud specifically. So we've already covered implementing workloads and all that comes along with that, as well as in our last episode, creating the conditions for success um, and all of the capabilities there. So work around platform management, enterprise architecture, et cetera. What we wanna talk about today and what we really wanna focus our discussion on in this episode is building the platform ecosystem. So for those of you who can't see the visual, you're listening to this on the podcast, when we say building the platform ecosystem, we're now really into the core of what a proper cloud platform or a cloud ecosystem uh, needs to entail. We're talking about, um, at least up in the early days, uh, building and deploying your landing zone across the cloud integrating landing zones across different technologies. So you may have an Azure cloud landing zone that you're integrating with your power platform landing zone. You may have uh, Lego bricks or building blocks for core data platform services or core integration services. So integrating all of that together, building and maintaining and growing your institutional data model, the IDM, which if you are familiar with Microsoft's common data model, in Dataverse and in business applications, an IDM is like a common data model for your organization. So if you're a shipping company, you might have a data model to represent vessels or cargo or uh, whatever your line of business is. Core platform or core data platform services. So think data governance, Microsoft Purview, think the data, you think fabric services, one lake or uh, you know, your, your organization's data lake or multiple lakes. So those core data platform services that all the rest rely on. Enterprise data governance, I mentioned purview a moment ago. And then finally, I think this is the biggest piece of ongoing work and it's integrating workloads across your ecosystem, across the estate. So we've moved far away from building the workloads and now we're talking about how to make tens or dozens or, or hundreds or even thousands of workloads all work together in your cloud ecosystem. So that's our topic today. How do we build these cloud ecosystems, building that platform ecosystem? And then in our next episode, we'll, we'll go a layer down. This is great. I mean, one thing that just popped out to me there under IDM institutional data models. I was working for a customer about, I don't know, six years ago, and they were in, they had, they were a train company right? So their own railways. And they had acquired, and this is in Australia, they'd acquired, I don't know, three or four other rail companies across the, the various states. And it was interesting to see that the the IDM, as you call it, was the hardest bit they struggled with because each of these rail systems, even though they're in the same industry, had such different ways of naming and labeling things. And they 
there was this kind of conflict internally around, no, we don't call it that. We call it this. We don't call it that. And so part of what we had to do, because we were moving them all to a single system, a single data set, a single view of what was going on in the organization, was getting them to agree on a common labeling IDM for the organization. And that was a lot of work because for whatever reason, you know, the the history, the the history, the legacy, people wanted to protect the way they labeled it because it had some nostalgia, you know, from way back when. So I think that's such an important thing to index on um, at this at this level because having an organization common language for things allows for so much more to be done because you're you're taking the risk of misinterpretation out of the mix in designing solutions. I also think that once you have a once you have a common language, um, it goes beyond having the same labels for for data even, even though that's a very, very important topic. It sort of reconciliates uh, the people who would rather just mandate, you know, we, we will do things this way because I am the boss. I am the VP of, um, I don't know, engineering, or I am the VP of commercial and I say this sort of data is going to be reflected in, in this manner. And the moment these people who, um, rather want to wear the, the boss hat are starting to talk to each other and, and instead of mandating, you know, what's going to happen, they actually come to an agreement. It even moves beyond indexing data properly. It even goes into, okay, so these people are going to start talking to each other. They're going to go for a drink, you know, or for lunch and they're going to, start talking about technology and their own ideas and uh, ultimately, hopefully, they're going to establish the technology. Because I think that with this particular layer, we are potentially going a little bit into cross-cloud. I think we're quite Microsoft, obviously. But at this point in time, we are talking about organizational level. And many times within an organization, you will find those people who are there for the past 25 years and they have built their stuff into one type of technology. And even though you're coming with, uh, you know, Microsoft view and an ecosystem architecture, uh, you can't just create something separate from it because then it won't be an ecosystem. It will just be a bigger silo. So <laughs> the moment people start agreeing on emotional stuff, exactly like you said, Mark, then we start talking about real technology and what, what the best decision is for things. So I want to throw a spanner in the works. I don't think this is at all about technology. <laughs> I think it's, I think it's part of it, but, um, I think that as the era of enablement takes, takes ahead, I think technology becomes the tool. I think we gotta, we gotta think about, okay. So like, Mark, based on what you said, the people part here is really important, right? Like we have to be able to say, you know, what are the people really expecting? What are the people looking for? And Anna, you made a great point around like people are going to meet up and talk and do the thing. And ultimately that's going to be around some of the technology, but actually the way, the way we break it down is we say, all right. The primary is the people, so they're like the epicenter, and the epicenter is really what we want to drive from an enablement perspective. The next layer around that, the kind of core is the, around the core is the processes, and you say, okay, well, you know, what are the things that like these people need to do? What are the what are the layers of process that we need to bake in here? And then the tech is the thing that enables that, right? So the tech is the thing that just surrounds it. And let me use I'm going to use Copilot as an example here because I think this is really interesting. When you look at the three the three kind of buckets or brackets of what people are expecting AI to do. The first line or the first kind of bucket is adoption. It's not the, the tech's there, right? The tech is going to be there forever, but it's actually how do we adopt that and how do we drive an enablement through that technology? Now, I've seen the stuff that Anna and Andrew put together from a kind of defined and refined cloud ecosystem, and I use that internally at ANS. Like that's one of our de facto things to use because I think it's a really great reference ecosystem. But it's interesting because when we talk to organizations, they're like, okay, that's cool. How do we get people to do that? 
And I'm like, yeah, this is where it starts getting really real. So I hope that makes sense, right? Because I think it's like it's so much wider. I think that that you guys, Chris, you and Anna, have have hit on a a, a hidden benefit, or maybe a not so hidden benefit, or a hidden side of this this work building that platform ecosystem. And we started with the institutional data model, so let's pick up there, right? So when we think about that institutional data model or that common data model across an organization, I think that there's really uh, three core pieces of this. One is the business bit, right? Having that institutional data model allows different parts of the business, or if you're in an acquisitive situation where there's a merger, there's an acquisition or multiple, it kind of provides a path to normalizing data that is about the same thing, but is described and is shaped in a different way, right? So there's a huge business benefit to getting everyone speaking the same language. There's also, I think, an obvious data benefit, right? You can more quickly, um, you can more quickly integrate systems. We're going to set that one aside because I, you know, I know we, you think we want to talk about people here. The third is the ability to get enabling technology into the hands of people much more quickly because we don't have to screw around with having an argument about the data model every single time. So I think that, you know, a big part of this is, you know, when we talk about building that platform ecosystem for, from the technologist's point of view, it is about doing the hard work under the covers of what most users see, right, to allow users to take that technology, allow people to use that technology as an enabler without having to think about, oh my God, what's happening under under the covers because we've been mature in our approach to the ecosystem and we've done that hard work so that you can just go run with it and do great things. Oh, I think we actually we actually did a great job from hiding what's real from what the users are seeing. We call that encapsulating and we pride to use it as a programming method. And then we bundle up all sorts of data from everywhere with various labels. And then we struggle with data duplication. And I don't even want to put in the mix regulations such as GDPR. Like it, it can all be a, a big disaster that the user never sees. What, what are you <laughs> like? It's just, it's not necessarily a thing all the time for, for the user because it's just, it gets so complex that you don't, you don't even think about it as a user, right? But going back to what Chris was saying and copilot, not you, normal users. <laughs> I was just thinking to myself, is now the time we're going to talk about Steve Mordew's blog? Is now the time we're going to talk about Steve? Mordew's <laughs> no, blog? not yet, not yet, not yet. But not yet. We'll um, talk about that later. it's definitely front of mind was my, my midnight breathing last night, right? I guess going back to what Chris was saying with the, with the whole co-pilot functionality, I guess this layer of the strategic pyramid is cultural earthquake. It's not just the data, it's the various standards with regards to how we integrate things. How does the data flow? Uh, what sort of pointers uh, have we got? How are the teams going to work? What sort of governance and security are we going to establish ecosystem-wide? And I think Chris is solely right. Without proper adoption from the teams who are working on these things, I don't see how we're ever going to be able to do it. Because you and I, and we go there and talk about, oh, and we're just going to move, you know, unstructured data, such as your files and folders, your PDFs, and we're going to do yours semi-structured data, such as your Excel spreadsheets, going back to, to Steve's blog, right? And everything is going to live in harmony. But in reality, you will find that organizations will have people there who have been the subject matter expert on whatever piece of functionality that they thought was crucial for the organization. And then eventually they get a little desk of their own and they're the authority and everyone goes to them and don't they don't really learn desk. about anything else. <laughs> no, but their desk is a big deal. It's by the window, you know. Um, they have the picture of their wife where everyone else is hot desking. You know, the individual, they have created this great thing. 
and everyone comes to them and asks them questions. So they are important. So they're not motivated to go ahead and look for newer technology or other ways of doing things. And unless they have a really good leader, and I'm not saying manager here, who's ready to push them towards a strategic way of thinking and who's able to say, yeah, you did great last year. However, these are the things that I think we should work on as a team. Then that person's probably going to hug their Excel spreadsheet for, for years on end. And when you do come and you're trying to sell you know, ecosystem architecture, mm-hmm. like Chris is going to try and do, they're going to be like, uh-huh, no, that's not, it's not how we do things. And I have delightfully American of you to like, want to say, we need to do things differently. But you first started by saying, you're doing great. Now let's <laughs> talk about what you're, <laughs> you need to say something nice. And then you need to yeah. issue the criticism. And then you need to say something nice again. That's the way we do it. The old shit sandwich. And so and why I thought of that just then, and because I've got two points here. One, I've started reading the culture map. And, of course, that's a classic problem. They give an example of a French person that went to the U.S., thought she was being a rock star, and her manager was giving her shit sandwiches, and she just saw all the glowing bits of bread on each side, and he thought she was a rock star, and she forgot about the shit that he delivered in the middle because cultural differences. Anyhow, but I digress. One thing that Anna said then was, um, you know the person. And in my mind, I was like, I don't know the person. And then I knew the person. <laughs> you knew the person. <laughs> I had the sales rep in, in South Australia take me to a meeting to sell, to sell back then Dynamics, right? And because he had uncovered this large company in insurance, and this guy had spreadsheets connected to spreadsheets connected to spreadsheets connected to spreadsheets. Like it was the most advanced complex spreadsheet ecosystem that I'd ever seen. And he wow. brings this guy into the room for us to sell him why dynamics was going to replace all his spreadsheets. And he was <laughs> like, this is awesome, right? This is awesome. <laughs> and we, <laughs> We never heard from that guy again, right? And nothing happened with that account because he was like, <laughs> you've just told me how we're going to unpack why I'm the linchpin of this organization with this technology that might be better, but I will no longer be the linchpin. See you later. Uh-huh. <laughs> people, man. People, people, people. It's the culture thing. I think we should all, for for the next episode, we should all think of, who is the person that we remember from our past who was best at obstructing modernization? And we should just call them and be like, hey, do you want to come on my on my podcast? Yeah. This is a special <laughs> guest. <laughs> you owe this honor to the fact that you were the biggest pain in the ass I've had to work with. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's also um, much less important than we think or much less important than we thought at the time when we were working on the project. Because... And I don't know, I think we should start talking about Steve Mordew's um, uh, website because it was it's so relatable, right? We've gone from pain in the ass to Steve Mordew very quickly here. So yeah. <laughs> one of you need to make sure that you got that podcast, sorry, that, that blog up so we can bring it up on screen and people can see where to go to find it. So Andrew, maybe if you want to grab that. I guess what I'm trying to say is that uh, those connected Excel spreadsheets, they seem... Super important, and the individual who's actually developed them believes that he is the man. Nothing's mm-hmm. gonna survive, you know, unless he keeps on building on on his ex- Excel spreadsheets um, and continues carrying on with like manual reports and so on and so forth. In mm-hmm. reality, you will find that most organizations find a way to work around it. So when we're talking about workloads and deliverables, you will find that little by little, year by year, even though this person believes they're super important and the company will for sure die tomorrow if they leave it, 
they actually fail to recognize the fact that their application becomes less and less important. And when it's time for restructuring or a, um, a new cultural change, that's the first thing that's going to get dropped. So if you're one of those people who believes that your software product is the absolute best and it's a great idea to just hold all of that IP to yourself, know that you're better off just taking some new certifications and trying to revolutionize these things because there will come a day when you will become irrelevant, not just for your organization, but overall. But here's the thing. They're five years out from retirement and they just want to hit retirement. No, I'm, I'm serious, right? I've, I've had this in two organizations where the person doesn't want to change anything. They're five years from retirement. They don't want to learn something new. When I've, I've been there. I've introduced new technology and they're just like not interested. They don't want to learn it. They just don't rock the boat. We're almost at the end of my tenure. I don't want to make a name for myself. I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm about to collect my pension. I'm on my way. Yeah. It's a problem. But they've been in the organization so long and nobody wants to challenge them. Nobody, everyone's afraid of challenging them because if you're like, you know, the IT guy, he, he knows your browser history. He knows where you've been. And there's this kind of fear of IT and what they know and what they see and what they have on you. I'm seeing it more and more, man. Like, so I do a lot of work in, in local government, central government, stuff like that. And, and what I'm starting to notice is that I can speak for the UK, right? There is actually a shift happening. I mean, I'm chatting to people that are typical, like in a career, but also actually really interested in, in doing different things. The one guy I was chatting to is like, let's disrupt the council, blah, blah, blah. I can't mention names and stuff. And I loved it. It was brilliant. He was on a call with me today and I'm like, dude, this is amazing. And he started showing me what he had planned. And I just, I was blown away by the attitude, right? And what I thought, what I started thinking is that maybe you know, the young folks coming into the workplace, I say that like I'm a, like I'm an old bat, but <laughs> maybe, maybe the grads coming into the workplace and maybe, maybe the kind of push towards like redigitization and all that type of stuff is quite good. But I think there has to be a change. I, I actually agree with Anna. I think they, I think change will be forced. This is like a FIFO thing, fit it or fuck off. And you may be five years away from your tenure, but you, that's fine. You can hold on to it as much as you want, man. But, it's going to go. But that's where you need strong leadership, right? You need strong leadership coming in. And so like where I've seen big transformation, particularly in federal government scenarios, is where a young CTO or CIO have come into role. That's it. They're about to make a name for themselves, right? They're, they are. They don't have history. They're coming in. They don't care about legacy. They care about, hey, I'm going to create the new future. I just find it doesn't work with older chaps. Yeah, typical. I know what you mean. Yeah, as you guys say that, and and I, I totally buy it because you know we've all we've all seen it. But I do I do want to just offer, um, just want to offer a story from from long long ago. There was a when I was in in high school, I had a uh, a teacher. He taught me for geometry and for trigonometry. He had also taught my stepfather in the same classroom. In the same <laughs> subjects. That's how long this guy had been here. And Andrew's stepfather is not young. Just, just putting it out there. <laughs> he is considerably not young. Not my dad. Not my dad. And and he, he, not his dad. Dad never his watched this podcast. My dad watches this podcast all the time. I mean, he he I think was our first fan. But anyway, so this this teacher at the time, my mother. This was very very early on in. You know, when people were just playing playing around with, oh, we could have an educational web page, right? I had been through uh, his class, and, and I think I may have graduated by this time. But I remember my mother telling me this story that she was um, doing this workshop with some of the teachers in the school on how you can use this particular now long defunct product. And this guy had offered or this guy had already resigned. He was retiring in like six months. And he came into this class on a Saturday morning. And my mother looked at him and was like, what the hell are you doing here? And his response, and he had a great sort of um, country accent, and his response was, well, Kate, I thought that it is never too late to learn something new. 
And here's this guy who had been teaching the same subject in the same classroom for four decades and had turned up how to use how to use the the computer machine in mm-hmm. uh, in his teaching for the last six months of his career. So I offer that just you, you don't have to be a dinosaur. He's an outlier, and 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 often I find these these older people on TikTok that they are young in personality and everything because of their constant learning attitude, right? They've decided to learn it all. They've decided that they are going to keep their brain active. My uncle is a maths teacher and, you know, he's in his late 80s, yet he keeps learning because he goes, if my brain is not learning something new, I'm afraid it's going to start shutting down. And so it's kind of that attitude, right? We definitely not everybody's the, you know, let's write it to retirement and then, I'm going to go out and just, you know, smell of roses and things. There are those people, and I hope that for me, it's a goal for me, is that I'll never stop learning. I will always be, what is new? What is on the cutting edge? What what am I missing? What's the opportunity? The older I get, I just feel like there's so much more to learn. There's so much more to consume and know. It's also a feat of responsibility as well, right? So when you are that subject matter expert and you are, you have created something truly brilliant, like these tools are, I don't want to take anything away from them. They're probably genius, right? Even your guy with like tons of Excel spreadsheets connected to each other. I could never do that. It's like, it's, it's true genius, right? But <clears throat> the moment you do have strong leadership and you have this vision that other people are going to learn about that project instead of just letting you be, you know, to roll with it, then you as the owner and the father of the, you know, of the, of the thing, all of a sudden you feel a responsibility to, to teach others, hopefully. And then when you teach, you need to say things out loud And then, you know, eventually you need to listen to some of the feedback that gets passed back to you. And that's a type of learning as well. So I think we are with today's episode, we are talking to leadership a lot here, right? We're not here to, um, you know, cast any sort of ill will to whoever created an innovative product of whatever database they thought was useful uh, at the time, we're here to say, you, uh, leader person, have a good look at what, what you've got within your estate and make sure that you share that knowledge in order to be able to adopt these new ways of doing business, right? The 90-Day Mentoring Challenge is a comprehensive program to help you take your Microsoft business application career to the next level. Since 2018, more than 790 people from 67 countries have benefited from this program. I've heard from past participants that the 90-Day Mentoring Challenge helped them advance their careers. From switching jobs, starting companies, to gaining industry recognition like MVP Award, or full-time employment at Microsoft. Enrollments are currently open for the next cohort, which starts on the 1st of January, 2024. Find out more at ako.nz365guy.com. That's ako.nz365guy.com. I want to jump on something Anna said, uh, something that Anna said, though, about, you know, in this episode, we're doing a lot of talking to leadership. Actually, we're probably doing a lot of talking to and with leadership in all of these episodes. But it's one thing for us, and and people have been doing this since time immemorial, right? Complaining about how how the old folks don't want to learn anything new. And, you know, one day, Chris is celebrating a a very important birthday next month. So, you know, he's, he's going to be there sooner than later, right? But in any case, I think that there's a huge leadership imperative here. And I will share um, some some statistics. These came and I actually will share my screen as well for those who are watching, uh, who are watching on, on uh, YouTube. So 
I used this slide in a presentation that I gave Chris was there as well um, at the UK Emergency Services Technology Show last week. And these all come from The Economist, from the, the, the newspaper, the news magazine, The Economist, from the 16th of June uh, of this year. So um, there were three, uh, three statistics across three countries that were, that were listed. The first is that in the United Kingdom, there was an 11% average worker productivity rise in the most productive firms versus the least productive firms. The least productive firms saw no rise in productivity from 2010 to 2019. So if you're at the top, you experience this 11% rise. And if you're at the bottom, you experience nothing. Furthermore, in Canada, productivity growth tripled in the most in the most productive versus the least productive firms from 2000 to 2015. And then finally, and this one's a little bit tough. So I'm, for those who can't see the graphic, I'll try to explain this. Firms that were in the 75th percentile of of investment in, we'll say, in innovation, investment, and modernization, they enjoyed a return on invested capital that was 20 points higher than the median, and that gap had doubled since 2000, right? What I think about, and I, I go back to the fable of the boiled frog, right, where you put a frog in a pot of boiling water, they're going to recognize, the frog will recognize that the water is boiling and will jump out. But if you put the frog in the water and then you gradually turn up the temperature, the frog doesn't realize what's happening until it is too late. And I think this is why this is a leadership conversation, because we're to a point where modernizing is not optional, because the firms that are investing in modernizing are pulling out way ahead of the firms that don't. And this is across the global economy. Oh, dude. I remember, I remember watching this and I loved it. I thought it was absolutely phenomenal. And I will tell you, this is, a, this is about the way people behave as well. Have I ever shown you the trough of disillusionment slide with regards to upskilling consultants from a technology perspective? Have you ever not shown us the trough of disillusionment? Do you have it? I don't think I've got it. I'll see if I've, I'll see if I can dig it out. But basically, yeah, yeah, it's terrible. And I got shouted at as you, at a user group for showing this. So, you know what? Is it obscene? Quite frankly. No, it's just, I think, relatively accurate. <laughs> just while, you, while you're pulling that up, Chris, um, Anna, Andrew, uh, can you look at, uh, you know, this layer that we're looking at on your uh, strategic pyramid? I felt like we, we kicked off with the institutional data model, but we haven't yeah. really covered landing zones. We haven't covered core platform service and data governance I think we, we we haven't necessarily covered integrated workloads across the estate. And I just think we should perhaps, before we wrap today, as in we've got plenty of time, but we do index on those areas as well. I was hoping we'd come back to that. Um, I've put it back on the screen for those watching. Anna, you want to you wanna grab one and, and roll with your favorite? Oh, are you ready, Chris? Just before we do that, Chris, do you have your one? Yeah. Okay, should we, do we just look at Chris's and then we'll come back to that? It goes beautifully with, with the tech, right? So... I'm gonna. I'm probably gonna build this thing for you. So this is. I'm gonna use Power Platform as the example here because I think it's a good one. And you know, with regards to the companies not embracing technology, people are people be the same, right? And what is ultimately happening is that you've got a bunch of people, um, whether they're citizen devs or not, is irrelevant. And what will happen is that they'll go through this area of growth where they start learning stuff. So they're like, okay, we're going through this pain with AI, or we're going through this pain with learning, and we don't necessarily understand it. But hey, you know what? Like this is hard stuff, right? And what happens is everyone kind of gets to the top of the hill and they're like, cool, we're experienced makers. This is absolutely awesome. Like we built something cool. And that could be companies, right? Companies going, holy shit, like we've we've come out on top. Like we've implemented low-code workloads. We've implemented Azure workloads. Like we've built an ecosystem. This is absolutely awesome. And then they upgrade again to whatever that is, right? Like superheroes or cloud ninjas. I don't know. Cloud ninjas sounds cool. And ultimately what happens now is that with the technology coming out, like tools like Copilot and AI, you are able to now fast track across that growth gap because of the fact that the tech is actually a lot stronger. But what's happening is that there are a lot of people living in this this well or trough of disillusionments, companies and people who are like, oh, that's revel in the world of finance and operations and X plus plus and never shall we ever grow. And eventually when X plus plus dies, fine, you know, cool, what are they going to do? Eventually when Dynamics 365, most of the config can be done 
with Copilot, what are they going to do? When companies don't implement AI and they're still living in this well of disillusionments, there will be companies fast-tracking way above them and way faster, right? And it's actually a vicious cycle. So what you will ha- what you will see is that there will be money. There will be more money, and a lot of consultants do this. They're like, okay, and companies do this as well. They're like, holy shit, we're going to stay there and then move because that company is offering us all the money. But then, fuck, that's great, but we can't move because we're in this place of like <laughs> blockery or t- digital digital disillusionments, right? But unfortunately, all these companies that are coming up now, like startups or you know the Lewis Baybots of the world, are like driving past in Ferraris, flinging the bird at everyone, going, well done, cool for you, man. You stay there. I'll just get there real quick and make loads of cash. And that's what organizations are happening. And actually, one last thing, is that that is a, that is a snake that eats its own tail. And it's terrible because the companies that think things like AI is a fad or like, yeah, like AI is a fad or tech is a fad or low code is a fad, you're all stuck there. And I'll tell you what, if any of you are listening to this, you better sort your shit out quickly from a data and security perspective now. And I'm talking to people as well. And you better start picking up a book and learning because if you don't, you are going to be stuck there. And unfortunately, you're going to be living in the trough of disillusionment and eventually make yourself redundant. And I'm talking to organizations and people. So I'm done. If you could not see Chris's slide, you've missed something. You've missed something huge. (laughs) Terrible slide. slide. That's the beauty of it is how terrible that slide is. It's horrible. My problem is that everyone, everyone's hands are like happy and I don't understand why everyone's happy. Like, I don't know. I built it three minutes before a user group presentation because somebody was arguing with me about the fact that I said functional consultants can be maybe relevant. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, so that's a very, very good point, but it depends, Chris. It depends on how you actually define yeah. functional consultants. Oh, I have a whole presentation of this. Would you like to see it? <laughs> are, they, are they the same quality slides we've come to know and love? They, they absolutely are. They're incredible top quality. They're even names <laughs> against them. <laughs> this, is one, this is one thing that I love. Again, Henry Ford said this, and he said, if you keep doing what you always did, you'll keep getting what you always got, right? And the thing is, is that actually that's not true right now because if you keep doing what you always did, you will get much less of what you always got, right? Because you will have market share <laughs> taken from you by people that know shit more than you do. And I said this on a podcast today. I was like, people are like, okay, is AI going to take my job? I'm like, no, the people that know AI are going to take your job. Yeah, exactly. And and I I, I love I love what you said because there's another and um. I'm actually just reading something very similar to, to what, to what you've just said now. They are actually referring to the phrase with, with great power get, um, comes great responsibility. Now, unfortunately, the author of my book is convinced that the line comes from the movie Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, hang on. <laughs> please, please, we need to tag that author when we post this on. That that is golden, right? So not, he's an American as well, so you know, if it only happened in America, it doesn't matter. But he is right. With great power does come great responsibility. So you're right. If you're if you're chilling in your um, <laughs> in your um functional consultant pond, and right now you still have a lot of return of investment. That's great, but um, like you shouldn't, you shouldn't, um, you shouldn't ignore the fact that you do have great responsibility to keep that going. And with that, I'd like to go back to your pyramid, Andrew, because. Apart from the, uh, the institutional data model, we are talking about standards overall, right? So we're not just saying that the, the data model should be, uh, consistent throughout your, or your organization. We also say, for example, that you should have enterprise data governance. So it's really great if you're working on a Dynamics project, for example, we do have governance there, 
we're pretty chilled because we have like security roles and all of that upgrades to uh, the the Microsoft 365 system and then eventually to to Azure. Um, and we're happy that we have data governance. We are talking about enterprise data governance. So we are introducing uh, products and systems that are looking at our overall strategy and our overall data flow and data quality and data sensitivity across our estate, not just within Power Platform or not just uh, within even our Excel spreadsheets et cetera, et cetera. What we're saying here is that when we're looking at building a platform ecosystem, you should have a coherent strategy on how you're going to do data governance overall. And you can't just call yourself successful because your, your power platform has field level security. Like it's just not going to work that way. If in the end you're, you're using integration with just one admin account and then all of their data ends in a SQL database that everyone's an admin to, then you don't have what, data coverage oh, no. at all. Is that not okay? Is that? Um, I, hear, <laughs> I, I hear it isn't. It's just what my friends tell me. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't make a service account to do, do everything. Oh, shit, Anna. If I'd known that, oh, man, everything's ruined. I just had this flashback, and and yeah, the flashback concerns Keith Watling. So I'm sure that some of our listeners or some of our, our you know, folks who are Everyone knows Keith, right? So, was he clothed in the flashback? No, I was going to say, was he wearing clothes? <laughs> was he speaking to you from his butt? <laughs> Keith does like a fine outfit, so he usually is clothed. But listen, so so Keith Keith calls me. This is a few years ago, and he says he says you're never going to believe this, and he proceeds to tell me this story about an organization he was working with that shall go unnamed, where they had a dev environment, a test environment, and a production environment. And what they were doing is they were writing code and, and making customizations in their dev environment. And if they thought that they worked in dev, they then went into their test environment and wrote the same code and made the same customizations in tests. And then they tested it and they thought, wow. well, it works there too. And then they went into prod and they did the same thing. It's just manual ALM. Yeah, manual ALM. It's stu yeah. student-driven CICD. <laughs> hey man, you gotta have you want some hamsters. He could not contain himself. He was dying. Uh, like he, he just he could not with with uh, us. That's not a put put the robot back in the human man. It's really important that you get as many people as you can to rewrite everything over and over again. Right. <laughs> so genius. But I can understand why they're just putting people in jobs, man. They were well practiced. I mean, they had a lot of practice making that customization. They did it three times. Andrew, tell us about landing zones in this context. So this is one, I, I spend a strange amount of my time, a strangely large amount of my time thinking about landing zones, right? This is a concept. First of all, let's talk about what a landing zone is. And at its core, it is a landing zone is a collection of technical services that you have deployed and configured such that you are now able to land workloads into the tenant, into the environment, into you know the virtual machine, into whatever it is that you're landing these workloads in. You can debate some of the finer points of this. You know, a pure landing zone is ideally written. Um, you, you may have heard the phrase "infrastructure as code." You can deploy the thing as code, and it you know, kind of materializes, right? There's a different take on this in Azure land versus Power Platform land versus you know, fabric land, et cetera. But that, that's what a landing zone is. So this is for anyone who is in the business of building cloud infrastructure, whether that is your Azure tenant and the subscription and the, um, the connections and the express routes and, you know, et cetera, that there, or whether it's, it's building your power platform environmental architecture, whether it's building your, um, your, your primary data lake, whatever it is, People who are in that world know what a landing zone is. 
what I find is that people who are more in the implementing workloads or that has been their career up until now, they don't think in terms of building a landing zone. They think in terms of, I have this app, I need a place to put it, let me build a place to put the app. So the best way to think of the difference is that a landing zone is like the foundation for your house. You would not put up walls of the upper floors of your house until you had built a good foundation. Whereas if you come at it from a workload mindset, you're like, I have a thing. I need to put it in the room. Let's build the room. No foundation, no water, no electricity, no nothing. So that's what a landing zone is. And I think that the benefit to an organization deploying the landing zone for their particular technology up front, yes, it raises some of the upfront kind of capital investment, right? But it's so much better in the long run because you're able to deploy the individual workloads so much faster, uh, so much more cheaply. The other bit of this is the platform landing zone integration. And this is, I kind of alluded to it a bit ago where, you know, in, you've got your, Azure infrastructure folks who are going to deploy their Azure cloud landing zone. And you've got your power platform folks who are going to deploy their power platform landing zone. And you might have data platform guys who come in over top of Azure infrastructure and deploy their data platform specific components. But it's a non-trivial effort, right, to have kind of the overall purview or to continue with the analogy to be the air traffic control that makes sure that all of these, each of these different landing zones, each of these different bricks or runways, we'll say, kind of fit together in a way where you can quickly land workloads that span the data platform, the application platform, Azure infrastructure, et cetera. So I just can't say how important this concept is to starting off with your cloud ecosystem, or if you feel like you've screwed it up to getting that cloud ecosystem back on track. It's like planting the seed in the ground um you, you can't you can't not do it it's like a digital digital map man then you can look at the other things that that you that you've got in the estate we've got their um uh core core data services now once you get once you start working on on a project on a platform ecosystem once you win uh, a deal to go in and, um, you know, and do stuff, it's important to understand that it's very likely that the stuff that you're going to do or improve or create is not actually the core system that these people are using, right? So even integrating this core data platform services with the rest of the state using the same principles, using making sure that you have landing zones already, making sure that everything integrates in the same way. We call it neighborhoods because we like to standardize the way you're going to use technology to, in to integrate your data across the state um, using the enterprise uh, data governance principle then you need to recognize this, this core data platform services and the core, um, the, the core service is what the organization actually does. So maybe you are there to improve on, let's just say the, the example of the HR system, but they are there to sell planes. That's their business. Those are their core business models, but that does not mean that you don't have to make sure that your HR system doesn't integrate with the whole thing so that people are trained and onboarded and interviewed and, and so on and so forth. And it doesn't mean that your uh, landing zones shouldn't be solid or that you shouldn't look at the institutional data model, even though you don't have necessarily access to or you, you're not, your workloads are not uh, tapping into all of the systems throughout the state, but having a standard or at least knowing about it is important. If you are to do something relevant, that's not going to be, again, just a silo somewhere that other people have to knit into the entire system and 
that exposes you to to gaps and vulnerabilities and and so on and so forth. There's a a burning question that I have had for the last 10 minutes around this level, building the platform ecosystem, and that is the how. And and why I say the how, in what you've published, there's a lot of um, this is what it needs to be, but there's what I feel is missing is the how. If you take people that have been great at implementing workloads, they've been great at creating conditions for success, and as we've discussed before, those two levels of the pyramid within five years are probably going to have AI do a lot of them, right? As in, so in other words, we, we become irrelevant over those two levels. So therefore, if I'm thinking, okay, I need to get ahead of this game and my role in the career position I'm in, how do I build the skills to be able to consult solidly around building the platform ecosystem? And so therefore, where are the resources that I go out and look at, you know, what is landing zone deployment? What is platform landing zone integration? How do I get really good at that? How do I become authority on that? How do I become a, an authority on institutional data models and being able to go into an organization and create one? What are the steps that I need to do? What What's the consulting skills I need to acquire? When I look at core data platform services, what should I be searching for? What should I be constructing? What should I be building out for an organization if I'm called in to do that? Enterprise data governance, integrated workloads across the estate. How do I make sure that I am rock solid across these parts? What are the skills I need to learn? Do I need to go get a TOGAF certification? What What do I need to do? What do I need to do to really become the guru or the authority at this layer? Being that I'm already coming from perhaps a, a, a guru and authority on the implementation workloads and creating conditions for success. What's your advice for those people that go, you know what, I, I, I see the puck moving, I see where things are going and I need to get ahead of that game. What do I need to learn? Where, where can I find the learning? Where can I find the training to go deep into that area? Why is it always a puck that's moving? Because it comes from a uh, a story, uh, and I forget the famous American that said it. I think it was, I th- oh, oh, the Canadians are upset. I think it was a famous Canadian who said it. It's got to do with ice hockey, right? It's I- I- ice hockey, isn't it? Uh, yes. Isn't it? Is that what it's got to do with ice hockey? And it's got to do with don't play, you know, don't go, don't skate to where the puck is now. Go to where it's going to be next. I think it's a Wayne Gretzky quote. I could be, I could be wrong though. Yeah, Gretzky is definitely it because that's a, that's the the word that was in my mind. Yeah, is he Canadian? Pretty sure he's Canadian. Please, I mean, someone. I'm, I'm not a hockey fan. <laughs> okay, but, uh, I'm I'm looking it up. I mean, I don't know, but what I do know is that I always want to be in Andrews. <laughs> I always want to be in Andrew's team when I'm in a pub quiz, right? He knows so much trivia. Here's the actual quote. When you win, say nothing. When you lose, say less. Oh, I didn't know that that's actually the precursor to the, to the quote. I skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it has been. So he's actually got about three quotes in that one quote. And where is he from? Where was he? Yeah, he's, he's still around. Where is he from? Yeah, okay, I'm just Let's typing. See. Where where was he born? Canadian. A, yeah, a, a, is a Canadian former professional ice hockey player. There Brant you go. Ford, Brantford, Canada. He's 62 years of age. He was born in 1961 on the 26th of January. There we go. Sorry, Wayne, for calling you American. It's just as bad as somebody calling a, a Kiwi an Australian. <laughs> <laughs> right. But they're literally the same thing, Mark. <laughs> Wait, you know what I, I get i get confused for every possible race kind of culture you could possibly think of man like well southern hemisphere at least i was told that the other day i was a kiwi then an aussie i've asked, been asked if i was from argentina i have a lot of questions i tell you what argentina i reckon is the untapped area of it future people in argentina i yeah yeah I don't know if it's completely untapped, though. I think in my observation, and I look look at the the stats of my podcast over the last six years, and I'm lowest represented in in viewers in South America and Africa. As in, and I'm talking about the continents here. Thank you for, for thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I honestly, you're yeah, okay, but it's changing, right? As in, but yeah. that's just my observation. 
is that I don't see audiences in those two regions, yet I see massive audiences across Europe, America, and uh, South Asia and those type of areas, but not those two continents. When we went to Argentina earlier this year, we actually saw an immense amount of digital nomads in Argentina. So I do think things, I do think things are moving and um, it's going to be, it's actually a shock to me that you're saying that Mark is untapped. I was expecting it to be quite flourishing over there in, in Argentina already based on, on the people that we've met just walking the streets or having a coffee, you know? And the speed of their internet as well. <laughs> I'm often putting jobs up for people for my personal work um, on Upwork. And I look at where are the countries that are most represented, right? And of course, I see India well represented. I see Pakistan well represented. I see um, Ukraine well represented in those that, you know, those gig workers, if you like. I don't see anything, very little from South America. I'm seeing more come out of uh, Africa from all the different countries in Africa. But as I say, uh, South America, I'm not seeing those people on those platforms picking up gigs, having very specialist skills. That's my observation. My sense about Argentina, and, and, and like Anna said, we spent, Anna and I spent, and, and Alexandra spent 35 days in South America, across Argentina, Uruguay, and Chile earlier this year. And, you know, I, I have different thoughts on each of those places. But, you know, since we've been talking about Argentina, um, what a what an, an incredible place. It is it's beautiful. It is uh, clean. It is modern. It's filled with educated people. I think that, um, you know, if you, you read the history of Argentina over the last 50, 60 years, it has had some very difficult economic times, which probably contributes to maybe that underrepresentation. But that is, in my view, in no way attributable to, you know, it's just a very educated, very modern society from, from everything that, that I can tell. We, we loved it there. We, we would move there if it wasn't so far away. Mm. <laughs> why are you, why are you, why are you avoiding my question? Oh, no, no, we just went down a rat hole. No, no, I, I know, I know, no, I know, no. But let's come back to building the platform ecosystem. How, how do I get skilled up in these areas? And, and what I'm really, I suppose, asking Andrew and Anna is that you go back to Cloud Lighthouse. By the way, if you haven't seen it, folks, that went live last week. Um, you can find it uh, as, as a company listing on LinkedIn. And then you can also go to Cloud Lighthouse dot, sorry, Cloud Light dot house. And, and check out the webpage that we now have set up for the show. But I think, guys, it would be awesome to add further learning resources for folks, like, and just bash them all in there. All those, yeah, there you go. Got it up on screen. Now, let's, let's smash those all in there and give people some learning paths, some opportunity to find out. Um, Chris. Honestly, bro, bro. Why do I look so sad in that picture? <laughs> send me a, send me another photo and I'll get it swapped out. In fact, any of you, if you don't like those lips. So from my perspective, um, my, my answer would be twofold here. Once again, this is a leadership thing um, because the effort to learn some of these things and I'm skilled is going to be considerable uh, and you may not be able to learn it by yourself. So if your leadership wakes up and realizes at the, in the, <laughs> where they are in Chris's slide, you know, they're going to start hiring some experts. Now these experts, uh, for example, in landing zones, yeah they will have to be friendly and like normal people yeah who want to who want to share some of the knowledge and start working together with with other people so in my opinion the very first step is to have leadership adoption and leadership um authority here 
and the willingness to invest a little bit in, in this skill because I think we we must stop with oh power platform so si- simple, dynamic so simple. No, everything requires investment. So we need investment. That's how we do it. That's how we start doing building ecosystem architecture. Yeah, number one. Then if you really wanna if you really wanna learn about it, pick a subject. I guarantee that Microsoft has a learning path for it. There's a learning path on governance, on how to do, you know, a Microsoft runs on trust system overall. Don't get scared about the fact that it's mostly, you know, about Azure because we are talking here about ecosystem architecture. So it's not just Power Platform. Yeah. Learn a bit about Azure as well. Um, there are, there are multiple learning paths about, if you will, an institutional data model and how data should be modeled across this, the state. There's a lot of learning now already about fabric. There's a huge amount of learning about, uh, industry clouds, for example, and those contain all of the above. So here's the thing. Here's the thing, Anna. Um, when, when I'm talking with people that are not Microsoft, right? They look at something like Microsoft Learn and go, you know what? I don't even know where to start. It's like a mega university. There's courses on everything. We're talking about yeah. enablement in this particular area in context of the period pyramid. I think there is a need for us to provide not necessarily a learning path, but hey, hit start here. Like if I go, I want to learn about fabric. Oh my gosh, where the hell do I start? It's fragmented. It's all over the place. I don't want to be like two weeks down a learning path and go, oh, this is actually not like it. It's taken me down a data science path or something like that. I need to step one, learn the shit. Step two, learn the shit that's going to build on it. Hey, how do I develop my leadership skills? Because I'm not going from a, I'm in a leadership position. I need to authorize this in my organization. I'm going from a, I'm currently a consultant and I want to move up to that next level. How do I as a person, so let's forget about the organization making that move. How do I as a person move to that next level? What are the skills I need to develop? What are the skills I need to acquire to become an authority at that level? And that's where I think that there's an opportunity, maybe even a course that you guys could write and make available that people could, could, um, you know, purchase or something like that, 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 that would give people this kind of learning path. So the, the, the problem is when you follow your nose type learning, you don't know what you missed, you know, and I'm always concerned about, I learn on the job. whoop de doo The thing is, is if this is all knowledge, you learned that much of it and you didn't realize you missed all this and you think you're an authority, you're authority on a pinhead right? There's the whole world out there that you're not an authority on, but because you're tied up in this little area, you think you are. And I think that's why guided learning and people that have spent the time going, what do you really need to know to be a guru in the space? Right, I'll pull those bricks together and show what this building looks like. That's what people are missing in the in the world that we're in, where there's so much information everywhere. I don't know where to start. My take on this is and the, sort of the, the cheeky answer, but true, is that Yes, Mark, we're, we're working on a course on this in all of our vast free time, right? So Cloud Lighthouse, you're going to find, you, you will find in the medium term future, say over the next, you know, quarter or so, some actual courses on cloud, Cloud Lighthouse or CloudLight.house. So that, that's there. I, I think that there, I, I can also share some advice, right? One piece of advice is to think about what you already know. And look under the the covers of that thing. Okay. So for example, say that you are a dynamics, a FinOps consultant, right? Or you're a FinOps administrator in an organization. And and you feel like you know FinOps. And you know you you know about dual right. You know that FinOps is dual writing to Dataverse. So you feel like you know what Dataverse is, but maybe that's the next hop. Go try to learn as much as you can about the things that are either under the covers of what you already know or adjacent to what you already know. So go learn what's happening behind the scenes inside of this Dataverse thing that you're dual writing to. And then start to follow the trail. Oh, okay. So I know about Dataverse. Now I'm going to learn about 
synapse, or I'm going to learn about um, the one lake capability and the shortcutting from Dataverse, shortcutting of data from Dataverse to one lake. So start with what you know, and then start to follow follow the trail. I, I also think that there's, and we could do around the room here of what is it that if you were going to recommend, so we're going to do this. I want to know from each of you, and I'll share my own, um, what are one or two technologies that you think are so are really valuable to learn if you want to make this jump into building platform ecosystems? Where is the Microsoft investment going? What are the linchpin technologies in your view? And I'm going to go to Chris first. What do you recommend people get smart on? Fabric One Lake Copilot. All right. And why? So I think that OneLake is going to be the data consolidation engine that allows us to bring kind of the, all, all the different kind of fragmented bits together. Together, I think that Fabric is going to be the mechanism to kind of call and talk to that data, and I think that Copilot is going to be the mechanism to build on that data. That simple. I think that low code is a product, or I know that we say Copilot is a product of low code. I think it's going to be the other way around at a later point. I think Dynamics will be the other way around at a later point. I think. It'll be subsequent when you're looking at like building something and you're prompting, the byproduct will be dynamics. The byproduct will be low code. The byproduct will be Power BI. But I think data, yeah. a mechanism to consolidate and call, and a mechanism to actually do the thing, that's how I see the pyramid working. And I've, I've thought that the day that you two did that presentation at the user group and you had the, the kind of one leg icon, I looked at it and I'm like, this makes absolute sense to me. That's what I think. Oh, I think it's purview. I'd look at purview because I think that trust is the number one thing that organizations need in order to enable anything else. So one technology that can <clears throat> have a watchful eye over all of your data and processes and who's touching what, that's crucial. So I would recommend that people look into that. Okay. And Mark, what, what about you? So I, I'll pivot away from any tech. You need to master the art of storytelling and uh. telling good stories. And you need to master adoption and change management because you're going to be taking people on a journey and people understand stories. They don't understand data. They don't understand or data points are, are, is more to the, what I'm trying to say here. So if you're saying that this is very much a leadership role, you need to develop the soft skills of leadership. Storytelling, adoption and change, how do you take people on a journey with you um, that have them wanting to go on the journey, not if you're like, you shall go on the journey because I'm going to whip you until you, you know, you get there. Um, so from a leadership perspective, I think you need to have the storytelling and the adoption change management nailed. And if you're looking at adoption change management, don't go past ProSci. It's the best thing out there if you want to, if you really want a, a formalized way of being educated in this space. And then the number of resources around storytelling um, are immense. Um, but I, I highly recommend those two areas to develop your leadership skills. Yeah, I totally. And I, I quickly pulled this up. I'm going to share for those watching the, uh, watching the video. Uh, this is from a presentation that Anna and I gave at Nordic Summit in Copenhagen this past week. This is why Anna said the watchful eye, because, all right, here's storytelling for you. Some slide animations, the watchful eye of purview rising above your master data node. Anyway, that's all. That's all. Okay. For me, I'm going to go, I'm going to go back to technology. Mark, Mark cheated here, but it was, I will allow it because it was really important that that be said. I kind of thought it was about tech, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. The technology that I will call out is Azure Cognitive Search. Um, I think that Cognitive Search has been something that um, for for some time now that people didn't pay enough attention to because they heard search and they sort of thought, yeah, you know, that's, yeah, we've been there. We've we've done that. But um, I, Cognitive Search, it, it, Cognitive Search is used to index the data estate, as long as your data has been consolidated into a data service that is addressable and accessible by cognitive search, it indexes that data previously just to return search results across an enterprise data estate, but it is now effectively the front door 
to an AI model built in the Microsoft cloud. That's what cognitive search is doing, the indexing of the data that the AI model needs in order to function and to learn. So go go learn uh, cognitive search yourself. So just to, to recap, we have um, Chris, we, we have uh, uh, One Lake, Fabric, and Copilot. Anna talked about Purview. I mentioned Azure Cognitive Search. And then Mark talked about storytelling and change management and adoption. So um, just there, uh, filter throughout the noise and start with some of those recommendations. There, start with things that are under or next to the things that you already know, the technology or the skills that you already have. That'll help you be more comfortable with it than follow the breadcrumbs. And uh, uh, tune in sometime in the next quarter or so for training coming to Cloud Lighthouse. I love it. I love it. All righty, let's switch gears. I take it we can switch gears, folks? I think, we, I think we're good. Okay, what, what are you learning at the moment? Interesting, interestingly mm. enough, I am learning about um, storytelling. <laughs> and um, maybe less about storytelling and more about story listening or, or, or leadership in, in, in general, you know, through, through books and through studying people. Um, just people around me, whenever we do a presentation, <clears throat> sometimes we've got opinions that are quite divergent from, from our own. And oftentimes I am pulled to one side and, you know, made aware that the reality is different to what we're trying to evangelize here, to advocate here, uh, from a product perspective. And it, it leaves me thinking, how are these people in positions of authority? How do they manage to convince organizations to give them a pile of money to waste away? So that's what I'm trying to learn, you know, these weeks. How do these people do it? Because, you know, I want to do it as well. <laughs> it's just, it's crazy in, in my opinion. It's just crazy. Yeah, that's the biggest thing that I'm interested in right now. I like it. I like it. I think listening, you really you touched on something there for me because I see so many sellers in, in our ecosystem, and I'm talking about inside Microsoft as well as outside <clears throat> as an in, in the partner, partner ecosystem. And they rock up with the slide deck. I'm going to present to the customer, right? And this is the first meeting. It's the first fucking meeting. And you're already got a presentation for them. And I'm like, <laughs> how the hell are you at presentation time? You haven't heard. <laughs> you haven't listened to them. You haven't asked any questions. But let's tell you about what we get, what we can do, what we are, what we, you know, who. and I'm look at all our awards. And, and I'm just like, how about we have no presentation, period, and we ask questions and learn and listen and it blows me away about how often and how I feel in my sector industry and stuff, we just don't listen enough. We always got the answers and we don't listen. We don't ask questions. By that standard, Anna should be should pretty much rule the world. Uh, I can pretty much assure you she is a better listener than any of the other three of us on this, yeah. on this podcast. Do, do you know what? I, I've taught chat gpt to listen rather than jumping to an answer so if you're in gtp4 you have this function to now in your settings to basically outline who you are how you want it to respond blah 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 and one of the key things i have in there is when i give you a prompt before you answer ask me any questions for clarification until you're absolutely certain what you want me to say now it always prompts me and then I'll get two or three prompts. Oh, but are you meaning for this? Or, And then when it gives the answer, I'm like, yes, on point. Because it hasn't just jumped to, I'm going to, you know, put my next word in front of the next and, and come up with what I think you're asking. It actually asks me clarifying questions to my prompt before it gives me an answer. And I tell you, the quality has gone through the roof. 
That's fabulous. I didn't know that it can do that. And I use it extensively. Like I use it for everything. I reply to no emails, <laughs> especially because we, we deal a lot with solicitors and stuff. Yeah, yeah, and perfect. It's like, perfect. what's the point? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Man, I found, I found it in the legal space. It is pretty phenomenal. As I say, I did it on my will. And I said, what did my lawyers miss? And it came up with four against New Zealand law, four specific sections. The lawyer didn't even put in there, didn't even cover. And I'm like, why am I paying my lawyer? You know? I really wish we had this technology before we uh, we we bought a really expensive house. Because now we're dealing with all sorts of... Well, in the UK, house buying is just a, sh a shit show in the UK. The UK real estate market and process is the most dysfunctional institution I have ever yes. worked with anywhere ever. I don't know how anybody transacts at the end of the day. Man, I don't get it. We just bought a place. It is the most diabolical thing I've ever experienced yeah. in my life. Andrew, what are you learning? This one is easy. I learned... I learned two things in the last couple of weeks. The first thing that I learned is that it is very difficult to operate a laptop while you are wearing an inflatable unicorn costume. Chris, would you say that that's... That's way out there, man. I promise you. Yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> so shout to uh, Chris's uh, co-presenter at Nordic Summit, uh, Rebecca Albers. Uh, she found out you cannot operate... A a laptop while wearing an inflatable unicorn costume. Yep. And far more importantly, I learned that the city of Malaga, Spain, is a fabulous place to have a wedding. But isn't Spain as as a whole just a fabulous place? There, yeah, yeah. Spain is Spain is a fabulous place, one hundred percent. Honestly, you know, I've spent. I think outside of the UK, it's the longest country I've spent time in. Uh, apart from, you know, Australia and New Zealand. And because uh, I walked the Camino de Santiago 33 days across the top of Spain. Amazing. Yeah, Meg and, I, Meg, Meg and I did that just before we moved to the UK. And then we had our honeymoon originally in Barcelona, been back there multiple times, traveled, you know, spent a lot of time in, in Milan, uh, not Milan, in um, what's it? Madrid, Madrid. Um and then in castles around there, because we did a thing called Vaughan Town there, which was teaching Spanish people English just as a volunteer. Um, and amazing, amazing, amazing experience. Just, yeah, I love that country so much. Do your your former students now all sound like squeaky, squeaky kiwis? Is that, <laughs> did you? <laughs> <laughs> Is that English? <laughs> Lesson. 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 Squeaky Lesson. kiwis. It's like Squeaky a minion. <laughs> Is that what you learned this week, Chris? Making that noise? Well, that's one thing. Yeah. That sounds like you're choking a chicken, man. That sounds like you're choking a chicken. Hi, baby. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> what are you learning, Chris? What are you learning? What are you learning? So this is something I've started to include in um, presentations when we do ecosystem enablement. And other than my six-year-old daughter, Luna, I don't think anyone can know everything. She legit, she legit told me the other day she knows everything, man. She's like, Daddy, I know everything. I'm like, rock solid, dude. We've got a podcast for you to come on. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's interesting, right? Because, yeah, it's interesting because um, what we've discovered is that, you know, we go into organizations chatting around ecosystem enablement and actually every time we do it with every customer, we learn something totally new, totally new. I mean, like, man, the one, the one organization is like, Hey, Chris, what are your best practices around document management? We're like, Oh, well, we don't have a, we don't have a work stream for that. So we'll just make one. So we did. And then another one's like, Hey, Chris, what, what about this weird thing in environment strategy? I'm like, Oh, dude, I did not know that, but we'll add it. So every time we do this, we keep on growing the ecosystem we're delivering to other people. So we've had this thought, like, why don't we just connect everyone up? And that was what this whole thing was about as well. But like, I've started adding this in the decks that I'm positioning because I genuinely don't know the answer to everything. Like, I mean, I don't understand purview. I'd love to learn it, but I don't get it. Like, I don't understand it. I don't understand fabric, but I want to learn it. But as long as I think my, what my lesson was is that as long as I try and like remain as like, not as gobby, but I am gobby, but I, you know, but try and remain like a little bit humble and think, okay, 
do I know this thing? No. Am I willing to tell people? Yes. Sweet. Let's go and find the answer. And actually, I've learned that so many people are more reciprocal of like the fact that I might not know, but I'm super keen to go and find out. And actually, I do find out and give the back the answer answer to them. And and for the most part, but yeah. I like it. Yeah. And Chris, as you were saying that, I was thinking about, I was thinking about how knowledge, you know, how knowledge spread a thousand years ago before, before all the humans in the world had discovered one another, right? And knowledge, a huge part of what was brought back to your, to one's homeland by explorers of that era was knowledge of other things and things that they had learned and things that they had seen that no one had seen before. And, you know, for the most part, um, as a, for the most part, we, we don't always get to experience that, but where we are in this particular world, in this particular, um, uh, moment in time because nobody so much of what we're doing is new and because so many things still have yet to be seen or have yet to be done in a lot of ways and this is a this is a very hidden value that i think doesn't get talked about enough in in the world of consult consulting is that a lot of what you're doing is you're sharing knowledge that you pick up in one place and you're bringing it to all places you are diffusing knowledge and ideas amongst many different organizations that would not have otherwise spoken with one another or would have not <laughs> otherwise shared. I had not thought of this until you said that, but I mean, gosh, if, if, if you're evaluating which partner to work with or which consultant you want to work with, do a little testing of how good they are at learning things and admitting when they've learned something and being able to take that knowledge and, and share it with others. Oh, man, 100%. What you were saying there, you imagine the transformation we could see in the world if industries would learn off other unrelated industries. Oh, my gosh. How are they doing something over there that's totally unrelated to our industry, but the concept, their thinking, their logic behind it, if we apply that to our industry, you know, and we've seen it like the Toyota way and and where lean manufacturing and stuff came from in the automotive industry, and it's been applied to others. But imagine how many different layers – could be unpacked. I think one of the biggest benefits Microsoft sellers bring to customers is their cross-industry engagement. Be able to bring, you know, I've seen this in this other industry. But that happens less and less now. I know, because everyone's like, no, you need to be industry-focused. Um, yeah. Anyhow, things that I'm learning um, at the moment is Figma. I'm doing a course yeah, on Figma cool. because it is amazing. And it's really driven off the back of a <clears throat> a sale that we made. I'm talking the collective we of a Figma uh, design I had designed around enablement, a tool that I've I've published before in, in my webinars and stuff. And it it was part of the enablement of selling a two hundred and thirty thousand seat deployment. Yes, thousand seat deployment of Power wow. Apps in Germany. And it shows that I think we've moved on from a world of we need to demo everything. As long as we can tell a story and show the art of the possible and what Figma does allows you to do that, what can be done on the Power Platform, you don't have to. When I hear people go, oh, it's quicker for me just to build a Power App, I'm like, fuck off. Your Power App looks like shit. You, yeah. you know, oh, yeah. like, oh, awesome. Yeah. And you guess what? The executive layer look at your app and they go, are you kidding me? That doesn't look like an iOS app. Right. And the thing is, but you, but, but you get a designer to do stuff in Figma. And I've, do you know what? I've found every Figma drawing that my designers produce. I have not had any trouble with my app developers then reproducing it in the app. It's just that they don't have the thinking to actually create that yeah. in the power app from the get go. Now, we didn't talk about Steve Mordew's post. <laughs> pop in and pop out, man, but if you, unless you're having to bounce, bounce. No, I've got it. I've got it. Okay, go for it. Sarah, sit, sit around. Let's take Steve's post in the next episode because I know Chris was Chris was in the thick of the comment stream. Okay, just can you put the post up on screen now just yeah. so the audience can see it and what's coming? Yeah, yeah. If it's ready, then. And then we'll pick it up. Chris, I'll see you next week in Vegas. Yes, dude. Ah. I hear it may be snowing there. Um, it could get cold. Um, the other yep. thing is is <laughs> the, the, the other thing 
is that I'm offline the following week, so it'll be the week after us. So I think we've got a two-week hiatus before we put our next episode out there. Oh, that's all right, man. Well, listen, I'll miss your musk. <laughs> Not next week, you won't. <laughs> Have a lot of fun in, in Vegas. We do. We're really jealous for not being able to, to be there. We do recommend that people read Steve Mordew's blog. Which one? Which one? Really entertaining. Sally. Oh, it's Sally really and entertaining HR? seven part, uh, blog post there. It's a, it's a fully fleshed scenario that tells a lot about, um, the realities of software development, even in low code. Talking about storytelling, this guy knows how to storytell, right? Steve Modu is a master storyteller. Yeah. He's, he, you can't get better than him, I reckon, in, in our space when it comes you to storytelling. You can visualize it, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. it's crazy. Yeah, I love it. One of my, one of my favorite parts, though, and, and I'll say, it, I think I could not help but notice a reference to one of our one of our co-hosts early on in this series when, he's, when <laughs> Sally goes to the App in a Day course with someone named Chris. Now, in <laughs> Steve's series here, Chris is a woman. But despite the fact that Chris was a woman, the whole time I'm reading about Chris and talking about when she's talking about how this is super simple. Don't worry, Sally, you can build this app. It's super simple. In my mind, I'm thinking it's super simple. Listen here. It's very simple. It's super simple. <laughs> So Chris, the woman, had a very deep South African man's voice in my mind. <laughs> awesome. All righty, guys. See you around. All right, guys. Thanks for a great See you later, time. guys. Bye. See you. See you all. Hey, thanks for listening. I'm your host, business application MVP, Mark Smith, otherwise known as the NZ365 guy. If there's a guest you'd like to see on the show, please message me on LinkedIn. If you want to be a supporter of the show, please check out buymeacoffee.com forward slash NZ365 guy. Stay safe out there and shoot for the stars.